Good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Marr. Uh, I'm with Risk Management Professionals, and welcome to our continuing uh, offshore facility SEMS webinar series. Uh, what we're trying to do is attack each of the different SEMS elements uh, one at a time and emulate some of the techniques, uh, provide some tips on how to get it done effectively, and basically share some of our knowledge at applying some of these things uh, in, in terms of uh, SEMS programs, PSM, and RMP programs. Uh, today we're going to be focused on uh, practical applications of mechanical integrity programs, and uh, I'll be speaking, as well as Carlos Cheek, and also an invited speaker, Mark Steinhilber, with the California State Lands Commission. Uh, before we get started, a couple of uh, tips on how we're going to work this. This is a live interactive webinar, so we're going to be keeping the participants on mute uh, for the duration of the webinar. As you answer phones, shuffle papers, have meetings, whatnot, that won't influence everybody else's ability to participate in the webinar. Uh, if you have any problems uh, during the technical issues during the webinar, uh, please feel free to call our office with the 877-532-0806 number that was displayed earlier or direct line into this office, which is 949-282-0123. You can also use your chat window to communicate with our uh, web webinar producer, Nicole Otramba. Okay, very good. And great. I, I guess it's hosted under my name, but Nicola Tromba is actually the brains behind all this, controlling all the equipment and make sure this goes as smoothly as possible. And so um, if you do have any issues during that, you can also chat with Nicole. And also at the conclusion of this, uh, well, actually, before the conclusion, we're also going to have a, um, an example computerized maintenance management software package just to give you an appreciation of the kind of things that are out there that can help people get their mechanical integrity programs implemented. Then we'll open it up for question and answer. You'll, you'll be uh, op you'll have the opportunity at that time to ask questions uh, either verbally or by chat, and it can be uh, then the, our producer can reiterate that. Cer certainly the case. Yeah, the focus for today is going to be on the uh, safety environmental management system uh, as. Uh, being regulated by BOEMRE, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Regulatory Enforcement. Uh, a lot of the concepts will certainly apply across a wide range of industries. So for those of you who are tuning in who also have to do risk management programs and also process safety management, I'm sure you'll get some valuable tips and some useful insights from this too. So before, um, I guess without further ado, let's talk about the key topics we're going to uh, work on. We're going, to, uh, we're going to be talking today a little bit of background about what is mechanical integrity, talk about what have, um, kind of events have occurred out there that have involved mechanical integrity failures that have led to the regulatory environment and some of the requirements that we've got right now. I want to talk about those specific requirements, key program elements, some tips on how to implement them properly, how to formulate an effective program, and also how do you monitor it and audit it periodically to make sure that you're gauging the health of the program and that it's doing what it's supposed to do. I also want to talk about some common deficiencies or things that have caused problems in the past that have uh, led to either um, deficiencies in the program or actually led to accidents. A lot of these deficiencies, for those of you who are tuning in outside the offshore, offshore industries, uh, a lot of those do apply throughout uh, the process industries. Uh, then at that point, I'd like to introduce Mark Steinhilber talking about agency insights from auditing SIMP programs for many years uh, for a variety of offshore facilities. I'd like to talk about the implementation of how people go about implementing mechanical integrity, uh, then provide you with a computerized maintenance management system. That's what CMMS stands for. And an example of that to give you an appreciation for how computers can actually help you get, get your job done. And of course, I'd like to open it up for questions. So I'd like to start with a little bit of background on what is mechanical integrity. Uh, the Chemical Manufacturing Association a long time ago recognized that mechanical integrity was a key part of keeping your facility operating safely and also reliably. Their premise was basically process equipment that is properly designed, fabricated, installed, and operated should provide reliable service if it is adequately inspected, tested, and maintained over the life of the facility. This statement was made decades ago and it and applies just as much today and to the variety of things that go into a mechanical integrity program, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. But first, a definition. Basically, uh, the core of mechanical integrity 
is maintaining the design function of structures and equipment. If you've designed it to function a certain way, by adhering to that function, it will mean that you're operating within safe bounds of equipment operation, and that it'll be, probably be, be mobile. Uh, mechanical integrity is required by a variety of what are globally called safety management systems, and a lot of these safety management systems are encompassed by regulations that go by the terms SEMS, Safety Environmental Management Systems, that's regulated by the BOEMRE, RMP, or Risk Management Programs, that is regulated by the uh, EPA, PSM, or Process Safety Management, that's regulated by OSHA, and also a variety of state accidental release prevention programs. A lot of the key elements, again, although a lot of people talk about preventive maintenance or PM programs, that is a key component, possibly one of the most important elements, but also inspection, testing, and repair are things that need to be encompassed by your mechanical integrity program. Now, the program can apply to any type of device or structure, but for a lot of the facilities that fall into the process industries, by these regulations that we're talking about, uh, tanks, pressure vessels, piping, law preventers, pressure release systems, emergency shutdown systems, rotating equipment, controls that run the full gamut of simple analog devices to, to uh, high-end dig, um, digital equipment such as safety instrumented systems, and anything that you take credit for in your hazards analysis that you're performing for SEMS or related programs needs to be encompassed by a mechanical integrity program. Now, does that mean if you've got a pressure vessel, you need to have somebody stationed there 24 hours a day to watch the pressure vessel? No. What it means is that you devise a program that meets the basic function of maintaining reliable operation within your original design parameters. Now, that's why the SEMS program, like many of these other SMS programs, are performance-based. How you achieve that objective varies from facility to facility, organization to organization, and it varies from equipment to equipment, and even for the same types of equipment, every piece of equipment has a little personality associated with it. Some are prone to certain types of failures where others are not. That all has to be encompassed by the mechanical integrity program, so you, you morph the program to meet the specific needs of the equipment to maintain the reliability that you're looking for. And again, the key focus is on maintaining reliability, especially of key safety equipment. However, um, that precipitates itself in terms of safety and environmental issues, and that's really the focus of the SEMS program and these other SMS programs. Just to bring us up to speed, I'd like to remind us of why we're here. Uh, many of the events that have formulated these safety management system programs or, and caused them to occur, SEMS, PSM, RMP, a lot of them were, have been rooted in, in mechanical integrity issues. I'm trying to emphasize how important this particular facet is, uh, and we'll get back to that in a few minutes. Um, a lot of these events that have occurred historically, back uh, uh, Flixboro, for example, were a temporary bypass that was fabricated that did not meet the uh, requirements of, of what the design intent was. Um, there's all uh, overflows of uh, storage tanks all the time because of level instrumentation failures that precipitate major events. Uh, the Texas City event, there were several instrumentation issues with respect to the reliability and uh, those, those failures were key contributors to what eventually happened, resulting in um, uh, 15 deaths and 180 injuries. Uh, and more recently this April, the uh, Deepwater Horizon tragedy, where uh, according to BP's incident investigation, and the quotations are right from their incident investigation uh, that's referenced, is basically that the law preventer was a uh, likely contributor to the overall consequences of what occurred as far as uh, in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon event that left 11 fatalities, 17 injuries, and over 4 million barrels of oil that were released. So all these events, a lot of these major events that have occurred have been rooted or at least a contri key contributor was associated with mechanical integrity. In general, all these accidents have caused significant loss of life and property. Uh, Long-term losses have also caused a lot of business interruption lost confidence, contracts, people losing their jobs, and increased regulation all at the same time. So it behooves all of industry to work together to minimize the potential for these accidents. After realizing that all these major accidents have been caused by a failure to maintain the design intent, which is your first line of defense, it's pretty self-evident of why mechanical integrity is a key program element. Now from these major, uh, this is a little bit of a busy chart here, but I, I, what I'm trying to show you is how 
major accidents have resulted in regulation. The top line is for onshore facilities, uh, the Bhopal India tra tragedy in 1984, the Mexico City tragedy the same year, basically precipitated a major awakening in the United States of uh, issues associated with chemical process safety. The CCPS was formulated in uh, 1986, and in 19 by 1987, recognizing the importance of these safety management systems, they put out their first guidebook. Uh, shortly after that, in 1990, the API put out its recommended practice 750 to kind of build on those and make it specific for uh, petroleum facilities, including refineries and production facilities. PSM was promulgated by OSHA in 1992, and in 1996, the EPA came by with its version of uh, prevention programs associated with the Clean Air Act, Clean Air Act that dovetailed with process safety management. So all these regulations precipitated from uh, accidents that have occurred that led us to the regulatory environment that we've got and these performance-based regulations. The second arrow there is a similar progression for uh, safety management systems for the offshore industry, accumulating most recently with the uh, imp implementation of the SEMS rule uh, that came out in the Federal Register on October 15th and uh, became effective on November 15th this year with implementation requirements for most of the elements by November 15th, 2011. So right now it's December 14th, 2010. We're actually one month into the year required or that was given to implement all these SEMS programs. That's why these are so important. And the next slide provides you with a little bit of an overview of what the SEMS program is all about. Uh, general provisions, SCI is safety and environmental information, hazards analysis, management of change, uh, operating procedures. I guess I should explain these just a little bit more. Safety environmental information is designed to provide a framework that communicates the design in a fashion that people can properly evaluate it with respect to hazards and also control the potential hazards of the plant site. Hazards analysis uses techniques such as a what-if checklist or a hazard and operability study or a job safety analysis to co get to the root issues uh, or for how scenarios can occur and identify potential weaknesses that then you can act on with maybe improvements to design or operation. Management of change is designed to control any changes to design or uh, operations that you implement at the plant. Uh, operating procedures to control day-to-day -day operation, safe work practices, training programs. Your, your operations personnel at that facility are your first line, of, uh, are the people who are monitoring the equipment and basically are a key part of your safety program. Training them properly is a key element to making that safety program work. Mechanical integrity that we've been talking about, we'll talk about more. Pre-startup reviews, emergency response and control if there is a problem, how do you effectively control it to um, minimize the potential consequences, and also how do you properly train your emergency responders to, again, minimize potential consequences of an event and prevent lives lost or environmental impact. If there is a problem, incident investigation is another important element. And then auditing all these to get a barometer and a read on the health of the program and how well it's being implemented. And we'll be talking a little bit about some auditing elements as they apply to mechanical integrity today. So if you look at the uh, events that are identified here, four items are in red. Hazards analysis, management change, operating procedures, and mechanical integrity. Those four elements have been one of the key precursors to major events. They have also been uh, noted as very hard to keep up with, and but also some of the more important elements of the SIMS program. Mechanical integrity is one of them, and that's why that's the focus of this module of our SIMS webinar series. So let's talk a little bit about the requirements. Well, 30 CFR uh, Part 250 is the embodiment of the SIMS program. If you don't have a copy, you can easily get it from our website that's referenced uh, at the, uh, the very end of the, in the question slide. Uh, key elements are the development and implementation of written procedures to maintain the integrity of, equi of equipment. Again, a key keyword underlined here is written. Having a practice that's not written down means it's subject to interpretation or different people can be doing different things. The reason why you have procedures is to capture the best insights and the best knowledge for what people are doing out there. Second item is training of maintenance and inspection personnel. Keeping people out there trained so they can do their job safely for themselves and effectively to maintain the design intent of equipment. 
third bullet on that is inspections of tests that are performed on process equipment, identifying the frequency of inspections and tests that are consistent with manufacturer's recommendations, good engineering practices, and also we'll talk more about feedback loops, but those observations that are made that indicate whether equipment's functioning properly or what portions of that may need to be maintained more. Or if you've got highly reliable equipment, where areas where you can relax your mechanical integrity program and maybe do a little bit less work. Uh, documentation is a key element of mechanical integrity program, correcting deficiencies that are outside uh, acceptable limits, and also quality assurance, ensuring that fabricated equipment is suitable for its application, uh, checks and inspections to ensure proper installation and consistency with design specs and also manufacturer's instructions, and ensuring that the maintenance materials, spare parts, and equipment are suitable for the applications at hand. Any replacement parts, other, uh, any materials that are changed must be compatible with your design intent. That is, uh, the mechanical integrity program is your vehicle for ensuring that. Uh, other regulatory requirements, uh, recognize generally accepted industry standards, things like API recommended practice 510, 653. All these here are, can be infused into your mechanical integrity program and are things that you want to make sure the mechanical integrity program is consistent with. So key program elements, um, this is how we address those programmatic or these regulatory requirements. First of all, understanding the requirements that we've been reviewing is key. What portions of those apply and how do they apply to your facility is, needs to be uh, part of your mechanical integrity program. Managing the program is also a key element that needs to be part of your mechanical integrity program. How are you monitoring it? How are you making sure the job gets done? How do you maintain the quality of your maintenance, inspection, testing, or repair activities? Having procedures in place for specifying these best practices and how you're going to go about doing that training to make sure people can get their job done effectively and maintain the health of the mechanical integrity program. Inspection, testing, maintenance, and repair, actually doing these activities and making sure they're done effectively. Documenting that they're, they're being done is a key mechanism for you to monitor the health of your program and its implementation of that facility. And of course, a feedback loop. As I mentioned, having a good mechanical integrity program um, is not only something that's required but if it's properly implemented, you can optimize the reliability of your equipment and do it for as effectively as possible. Optimizing reliability means for standby safety systems that work when need be, that you're less like, and for other systems that you're less likely to have accidents in the first place, and also you're, you're going to be less likely to have problems with uh, and maintain the reliability of your equipment so you can maintain business profitability. If you have a feedback loop where you're monitoring that, and you identify uh, failures at their incipient stage, or you identify those things that are most likely to fail, by keeping up on that and focusing your attention on that means that you can, some, in many cases, lessen the overall cost of the program. So that feedback loop, monitoring the program, is really important for maintaining the health of the equipment and also uh, maintaining your business viability. Uh, I'd like to uh, cover a couple of tips here. Um, organization and internal accountability. Uh, these are things that are very important to infuse in your program. Making sure the equipment specifications are maintained, make, made available. A lot of people use their uh, intranet for that uh, nowadays. Keeping that equipment, those OEM manuals and keeping all those equipment specifications handy and available is super important. Uh, making sure there's a clear definition of requirements. <clears throat> these should be part of your mechanical integrity program. What specific function is that equipment supposed to be doing? Uh, using software for tracking, generating work orders, documentation, and records retention. All these are critical functions, and using software can help get the job done efficiently. Now, does that mean you have to? No. Again, these are all performance-based regulations, so how you get the job done is really the business of the facility. These are tools that are out there to help you get the job done. And we'll be talking more about computerized maintenance management systems in a little bit. Uh, other key tips? Uh, fix it and tell your maintenance strategies are definitely not acceptable. You can't wait for something to break in all cases and then just go fix it. There are many things maybe you can, you can do that for, but in a lot of cases you need to have some sort of preventive maintenance to prevent the failure from occurring and also testing and inspection to monitor it and make sure, minimize the likelihood of its failure. Uh, you also need to make sure that you have a preventive maintenance program based on manufacturer recommendations 
or best engineering practices. And even if you've got a contract maintaining the equipment or performing your tests and inspections, you really need to have a written schedule for what they're replacing, overhauling, uh, cleaning, et cetera, and on what frequency. Those are super critical elements. Just having a contractor on site doesn't mean you can just hand the program over to them. Monitoring that application is very, very important. So those are a lot of the key tips in terms of uh, pulling, putting a program together. So what I'd like to do next is introduce Carlos Cheek, who's going to talk about more about program formulation. Uh, Carlos is a, a member of our engineering staff, and he's been uh, involved in several of these webinars and has um, uh, uh, engineering background and uh, is willing to share a lot of insights to your mechanical integrity program formulation. All right. Thanks, Steve. Sure. All yours. You good? Cool. Um, so basically, we'll be talking about where to get started with your mechanical integrity program. Uh, with mechanical integrity, according to the regulations, it's important to start with the uh, manufacturer's recommendations, with the actual um, O&M manuals that came with each piece of equipment. Uh, we have some examples that I'll show in a minute, but all of your, your valves, um, flow valves, pressure valves, all of those things have the manufacturer's recommendations, and that needs to be the baseline for where you need to start. And then based on field observations and things like that, it can be, an, can be adjusted, and we'll also talk about that as well. Um, your hazard analysis is a great tool that you can use to identify some of the critical safety devices. Um, we'll show a little example about that, but it's important that you start with your full, your entire facility, and then you can start to, you know, focus on those high priority, you know, things as well. Your whole facility needs to be included in your mechanical integrity program, but you can use your hazard analysis to kind of pick out some of those really high priority op, uh, pieces of equipment. Um, just like, I mean, so Steve listed just a few of those API recommendations or uh, recommended practices earlier. I just want to give you a few clippets. Uh, this is API 510 on pressure vessels. Um, you need to go through these API recommended practices and, and show, you know, they have a lot of recommendations on, on when these things need to be done. Uh, right here, we're just showing them for vessels, you know, at least every five years. Um, there we go. And um, internal and on-stream inspections at least every every 10 years. Um, it's actually half of the recommended remaining life of the vessel, or 10 years, whichever is less. And then, uh, again, from API 510, um, you need to have, you know, internal of the pressure vessel actually te tested um, every five years. So this is a minimum baseline requirement. Uh, just one quick example of some of the things you can find in the API recommended practices. I was going to go into some of the more specific equipment. Um, this is your, for your blowout preventer. This is straight out of uh, one of the user manuals, the, the maintenance manuals from the manufacturer. So these are the manufacturer recommended practices, which need to be your baseline for your maintenance program. Um, here are just some quick examples. And this isn't end-all, be-all. You know, it can be very different for each uh, manufacturer. This is actually for an uh, annular BOP. So things like the packer should be inspected weekly. Um, top ID lip should be replaced uh, between well servicing. Every two years, it's required that you basically disassemble the entire BOP and, and go through it top to bottom every two years. Um, when you're putting into service, you need to use 1,500 pounds or 15 PSI, 1,500 PSI, um, open and close the BOP 20 times. Um, that's a good example of something that's coming out of your maintenance program that needs to be included in your operating procedures perhaps. So it's, it's also important that your maintenance program is, is part of this whole SEMS program, and it interfuses with, you know, safety environmental information, operating procedures. All those things need to come together. I also <clears throat> just wanted to show an example from uh, 25516, uh, Blowout Preventer Systems Tests, Inspections, and Maintenance. Um, this is, these are the federal regulations. This is just a quick clip out of there. Uh, you need to have weekly crew drills on your BOP. Um, BOP inspections uh, must you visually inspect the, sy the system uh, once each day. And as part of uh, your mechanical integrity program, you need to document these things. So how are you documenting and showing 
that you are indeed doing these inspections, tests, and maintenance. Um, we'll give an example of that later, of one way to you know, demonstrate compliance of your documentation and record keeping for your maintenance. But, but the, the, uh, the point is, is there's a lot of these uh, recommendations and regulations out there, and you need to make sure that you're, that you're meeting all these requirements. This is for your um, surface safety valve. It's just one example, straight out of the, the manufacturer recommendations. So this needs to be a baseline. So if you say, you know, so what inspections and tests are you doing on your surface safety valves? Well, we're doing this, this, and this. Is that the same, or did you get that from your manufacturer's recommendations? So during an audit, that's the question they could ask. Okay, I see what you're doing. Where did you get these? Where, why are you doing this test once a month? Why are you doing such and such? you know, in such an interval. And you need to be able to show them the manufacturer's recommendations and say, this is why we're doing that. And um, just, just one example of, of something that you can pull out from there. Also, uh, API 14B, uh, design, installation, repair, and operation of subsurface safety valves, the subsurface. This is an example of the testing requirements. So this, they give you, you know, all the details of how to go through and test your subsurface safety valve, make sure it's, it's operating properly and whatnot. So these need to be in your operating procedures or the maintenance manual. So when they're doing these tests, you can show them we are following the recommended practices for, taste, for testing our subsurface safety valve. So it's important that these are connected with your maintenance program so your operators or whoever is doing this te the test, the maintenance team, what, whatnot, has this information available to them. This is uh, API 14H, <coughs> installation, maintenance, and repair of uh, surface safety valve um, and underwater safety valves for offshore. Uh, this gives a list of testing requirements when you're doing testing. Um, so every time you have some sort of certain repairs or there's a potential for a tear in the seal, things like that, you need to do a full test according to API 14H. So, you know, these are things that need to be in your maintenance program to say, hey, every time we're doing this, we're also doing this testing, you know, in accordance with API 14H. Um, so, so basically, you can, you can use manufacturer recommendations, API recommended practices, federal regulations. All these things go to putting together your actual mechanical integrity program. You know, how often are you testing, inspecting, and maintaining the equipment in your process? So, but as Steve was saying, it's a bit of a feedback loop. Uh, one motivator for that feedback loop is uh, premature failures. If you're getting premature failures in your system, you know, we're supposed to replace this valve every two years or go through it every two years, something like that, and, you know, we end up failing. It's failing every six months, you know, and we have to keep going back. Um, it's important as part of your incident investigation or your near-miss procedures, that you look at that valve and say, hey, why is this failing so often? We've had, you know, we've seen two failures of this valve in the past, you know, year or so, when it's supposed to be only changed every two years. So that's a good example of your whole STEMS program being fit together so that you can, you know, improve your, you know, the quality of your system. And in the end, what it comes down to is if you're looking at it, hey, we know we need to inspect it and clean this valve or maintain it every six months. Instead of that valve failing and you're, you know, potentially losing production or slowing stuff down, you just, you know, you just change the valve out before, before it fails because you know that it's going to fail. So it's, it actually can help improve the efficiency of your, uh, of your process. Um, it's also important <clears throat> to have isolation valves in particular on, on inspection lists. Sometimes people forget about the isolation valves and they just kind of get, they just sit there because you don't need to use them. And once you do need to use them, they're not actually fit for service. So it's important to keep those, those actual isolation valves on an inspection. So, <coughs> just a second. All right. Sorry about that. Had some uh, both technical difficulties, the battery dying, and uh, I'm kind of getting over the weather and whatnot. 
winter in California is pretty rough. So um, <laughs> we uh, so we have our baseline for all of our equipment, and you know we've been doing our feedback loop, um, getting response from our maintenance supervisors, maintenance operations, and now we can go ahead and you know start to refine our maintenance pr procedures um, using our, our HAZOP. Here's an example of you see the PSV 853. That's a potential cause of failure. So in your HAZOP, you have this valve failing open, and you know so something happens, you know fire and brimstone, and then but you have all these PSV 125, PSV 955, and so on. These are safeguards for this particular valve, you know, failing open. Now, especially you can see the deluge system. The deluge system has four scenarios involved with it, where it's uh, it's a safeguard, you know, potentially mitigating. Uh, the, the worst case scenario. So, you know, it's important to that the deluge system works because there's a lot of, you know, scenarios when the deluge system needs to be activated in order to mitigate the worst case scenario. Uh, another example, obviously, PSV 125 and 955. There's several scenarios with those as well. So you can see these are, these are critical mit mitigating elements, you know, to mitigate the worst case scenario. So it's important that these are especially maintained. Um, while you have the entire system, now you can focus on, on these and perhaps have a, what we like to re recommend is a second list. So you have your, your main, your whole facility, then you can have a critical equipment list that has, a, you know, perhaps an oversight. So you can make sure that these elements in particular are taken care of, that work orders are completed, you know, the maintenance on these are being done. So it's a bit of a checks and balances system. Is, uh, is the best way to do it, to make sure your critical equipment is being maintained properly. And I think that's good for formulation. I was going to go ahead and hand it back over to Steve, who's going to um, finish up with the mechanical okay, I'll take, Yeah, I'll take care of the uh, monitoring elements. Does this work now? This one's working? Okay, great. All right, Carlos, thank you for uh, giving us some tips on program formulation. Uh, what I would like to do is talk a little bit about, little bit about monitoring and auditing. Um, first of all, the real question is, what do you want to include in the program? What are you looking for? I, as I mentioned before, monitoring the health and well-being of your program is paramount to the success of your equipment in terms of reliability and achieving their functions. So really, what are, what are we looking for? Let's discuss that first. Um, you want to make sure if you're monitoring the program, if you're um, in charge of it, where a lot of people are doing things for you or doing things that you're at your facility, you want to make sure that what the covered equipment is is clearly defined. That needs to be part of your mechanical integrity program. Once you define that, you want to determine what the requirements are to maintain the function of that equipment. Procedures, training, inspection, maintenance, quality assurance, all those things need to be defined in your program. Uh, efficiently scheduling resources. If you've got, uh, if you notice that there's a haphazard application of mechanical integrity at a plant site, if it's not efficient, if things aren't properly scheduled and managed, there may be some deficiencies there. There may be things that aren't getting done that are very important. So looking at the overall implementation of the program and how well it's being done is a key uh, measure of how, how effective it is. Uh, make sure there's a good reporting system. The people out in the field, if they notice problems, are they getting it back to the maintenance department or whoever is in charge of it? Um, and also doing audits to make sure all these different elements are getting done. And making sure that the staff, that they're properly trained, they're professional, and they're out there and doing their best to get the job done. Other things that you might want to monitor for and what to look for in a program are written procedures to identify the systems, the methodology for inspections, what the training requirements are, what the maintenance response is, and also reporting. You want to make sure that there's information packages. I mentioned the importance of safety environmental information before. You want to make sure that there's key information packages out there that identify the system, the basis for the inspection, and provide supporting documents and drawings. As I mentioned before, this is a key Achilles heel for most facilities. As assets change hands, as people move on, as people change positions, it's really easy for key uh, design basis information to be lost. Encompassing these, these key pieces in your mechanical integrity program is really important. 
So let's talk about some auditing tips. Now again, uh, auditing can be an entire course, and in fact, it's a key element for SEMS and the other safety management system programs, and it's going to actually be its own module in, one of, in our webinar series. But let's talk about the sort of things that make sense for mechanical integrity. If you're doing an audit, recognize that it's a challenge. It's not one of those things you just go to the facility uh, and have a cup of coffee for a couple hours and you're done. They got a great mechanical integrity program. Everybody's happy. The more complex, the larger the facility is, you need to leave time for doing a proper audit and getting into all the nuances that are part of your mechanical integrity program. Defining audit objectives up front is very important. Making sure that you're defining the requirements and priorities to the audit, looking at the management of the program, procedures, training, the various inspection, testing, maintenance, and repair activities, how they're being documented. Are there checklists for daily, weekly, or monthly inspections? Is there a feedback mechanism, and is it working? Are people using the information, all the information that's documented? These are things that can be audited and need to be part of your audit protocol. How does the central office, which may be uh, based onshore, versus the field locations, which may be onshore, how do they work together? How do they communicate information? How do they get the resources and knowledge there to, to properly maintain the, um, the mechanical integrity program at the facility? So a key objective of the audit is to gauge the overall program effectiveness for mechanical integrity. Now, in terms of the focus, how you go and approach this, a lot of times you want to like drill down in a specific area and identifying a key component, such as something as Carlos talked about, might be coming out of your as a safeguard out of your hazards analysis. That's a good place to start, and then from that, reviewing all inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements associated with that equipment, and then looking at the records over a period of years to verify that all the mechanical integrity elements were performed. Um, audit techniques making sure, as I mentioned before, that there's a protocol in place, uh, reviewing documentation, uh, performing interviews for personnel. That's really important. It's one thing to look at what's on paper. It's definitely worth spending time with the people out there with wrench in hand who are actually implementing the program. There's a lot to be learned from them. Uh, they, they spend a lot of time out in that uh, field and spending some time chatting with them, uh, gauging their, uh, their training how well they understand the program, and there may be a lot of uh, weaknesses or insights that under other circumstances they don't have a vehicle to share, and, that can, and the audit can be very helpful in flushing those out and taking effective corrective actions. Uh, also, audit documentation. The do there is a requirement to document these and making sure that you capture all the elements and especially any corrective actions is really critical. Um, also, uh, doing a site walk down, getting out there and actually seeing the equipment. I, I put this, this photograph up there as a rather flippant example of, of a situation where somebody obviously wasn't uh, frequently testing a, a um, key personnel uh, protection measure. Uh, there's a lot of other more serious and more uh, catastrophic photographs of failures. A lot of them have uh, come out in the uh, CCPS beacon that comes out monthly. And there's a lot of good tips and insights from that. And in fact, uh, from our newsletters and from our website, you can get access to all that information. But site walkdowns, very critical. It's very important that the safety equipment has been tested and appears fit for service. What I want to do is share with you some basic deficiencies that we found with audits and we found with program implementation before I turn it over to Mark. Some key things that we found are uh, written procedures not being available, not being complete, or not being properly implemented and followed. Why write a procedure if you're not going to capture the best insights of your experienced personnel and then use the procedure to actually implement those? That's what they're for, and uh, written procedures may seem like a pain in the neck, but the fact is that they are a vehicle for maximizing the effectiveness of your program, which of course means maximizing profitability for a business. Uh, the second bullet, inspections, maintenance not occurring, or the frequency is not consistent with industry standards or best practices. This happens all the time. A lot of times, various departments that are in charge of mechanical integrity, such as your maintenance department, are way overloaded. And But dealing with that, and that's a continuous problem, dealing with that means maximizing the efficiency of the program. And so that's, that's why it's so critical to get that feed, uh, feedback loop in there. 
Uh, equipment deficiencies not being corrected in a safe or timely manner. Uh, facilities relying on a contractor, as I mentioned before, you can't just turn it over to contractors and call it a day. You've got to monitor their progress and monitor what they're doing and make sure it fits in with the overall framework of mechanical integrity at your facility. And then, of course, not documenting mechanical integrity activity. If it's not documented, you really can't show that it's been done properly. And being able to prove that may be important in a lot of circumstances. And it's certainly important when there's an audit being performed. So what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to Mark Steinhilber to talk about some agency insights. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Carlos and I are engineers with risk management professionals. And we uh, spend a lot of time dealing with the, the formulation and implementation of these programs for a lot of our clients. But let me give you a little bit more background on Mark. Um, Mark is Mark's with the California State Lands Commission with the Minerals Resources Management Division. He's a, a senior process engineer and supervisor of their safety audit program. Uh, he's led the program for eight years and has completed nearly two complete cycles of safety audits for all state offshore oil and gas leases, uh, lease platforms and facilities. He's from the Coast Guard and during his Coast Guard career, he led marine safety investigation, vessel inspection, port security, and spill contingency planning staffs in Northern and Southern California, and holds marine inspector and accident investigation qualifications. He used to be a staff engineer and naval architect in Washington, D.C. and New Orleans, reviewing designs for new and modified tankers, chemical ships, gas ships, barges, and mobile offshore drilling platforms. He's, uh, he's got a mechanical engineering degree from, uh, I got a mechanical engineering PE from Virginia in 1988, and has master's degrees in mechanical engineering and in naval architecture and marine engineering from MIT, and a BS degree in naval architecture and marine engineering from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Anyhow, welcome, Mark, and here you go. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, how's that? Okay, great. <clears throat> well, as a regulator here in California, we, we look at a number of uh, platforms inside three miles and uh, also some islands and onshore facilities. And from the state standpoint, we, we find it's critically important that the safety systems are tested on a periodic basis to ensure uh, adequate uh, availability. Uh, what happens out on the Outer Continental Shelf with BOMER or previously the, the MMS, uh, typically the testing is not done as frequently. They, they conduct spot checks and for a good portion of the year, the company is uh, on their own to conduct testing uh, on their own frequency. So we believe the companies need to identify what those frequencies need to be for their different pieces of equipment, whether it be monthly, quarterly, or even annually. So the, the first item here, we have testing and preventative maintenance of the safety instrument systems. And that's basically all of the process type alarms and shutdowns that are in, on your safe chart on a platform or on a comparable type uh, list for your onshore facility. In addition to the process alarms and shutdowns, you have an emergency support system which includes your uh, gas detection, your thermal flame and smoke detection, um, fire loop, which is, includes the suppression, uh, uh, deluge, and, and uh, fire main system. Uh, certain spill containment features need to be looked at, including uh, your response equipment, your spill booms, and so on, have a, a periodic uh, inspection that needs to be performed. The emergency shutdowns, uh, the pull stations, as well as the um, subsurface safety valve uh, controls and equipment. So all of these things have a, a uh, required frequency for inspection and or testing. Uh, it's important that even when you have uh, smart devices out there that, that tell you they are functioning properly, you still need to do the inspection, go out and look at the device. Uh, We've certainly seen uh, fire eyes that still have ta painter's tape over them, which may not get caught, uh, but the smart device is telling you that it's working properly. So 
it's important to, to conduct the inspections as they were designed. Other support systems that are important to look at on a periodic basis are the life-saving escape and abandonment systems. So this may include your uh, your air packs, uh, some of your your um, escape ropes, um, emergency lighting, and those types of things. Uh, uh, life rafts have servicing interval on them. Uh, those are the items that the Coast Guard is responsible for and, and may may come out and check on. Uh, with regard to firefighting systems, there's not only the fire main system, which is a fixed system, uh, with NFPA requirements for testing and so forth, but you also have the uh, the portable equipment that are typically uh, serviced by an outside contractor, and that is on a different basis. So when you turn it over, like Steve and Carlos were talking about, when you turn things over to a contractor, you may think that everything is being done, but if that contractor is only inspecting your portable firefighting equipment, well, your fire main and your fire pump may not be looked at. There may be a different interval for it. Uh, the fire main does need uh, testing periodically to see that its performance is satisfactory. So all of those items are in there. Those items need to get put into your periodic uh, maintenance schedule, and that's where CMMS comes in and gives you, it's a great tool to give you the reminders uh, what the inspection frequencies are or when you need to get these things done. Uh, sometimes the uh, emergency generator may, may be forgotten. Uh, it's good to start it up on uh, a periodic basis, but people tend to forget that there is a full load test that should be done uh, every so many years. I think the max is about four years. You need to put it on load, and, and uh, the performance of the governor and some of the other systems uh, involved with it may show up as being problematic. So those those full load tests are important. Uh, on your pressure relief uh, system, your PSVs have an either an inspection or a, a testing uh, frequency, and then uh, the flare and the uh, uh, some of the filters and, and things in line going to the relief device have a service interval. Sometimes the flame arrestor um, elements haven't been looked at and may be clogged, so those things need to get looked at. And then the control air system. Uh, your basic process controls and many times your safety system are dependent on control air. If you're not checking your control air, your your uh, your dehydration and, and so on, making sure that it's a good, clean system that will be reliable, uh, you can have problems there. So some of the other elements that we get down to, um, uh, tanks and pressure vessel integrity, uh, these can sometimes be forgotten. Offshore platforms typically go through an annual shutdown to get a lot of their preventative maintenance and, and some of the repairs done. And many times there just isn't time or it hasn't been properly scheduled. Um, if it's, if it's not on the list to get done, it's not going to, it's not going to be done. And there's very few opportunities to actually have the, the platform offline, uh, to be able to get into your process to, to, to get inside, uh, these vessels and get an internal inspection. Uh, we've seen Many operators uh, try and depend on a corrosion monitoring program that uses uh, various testing methods from the external, and there are some shortcomings with it. Um, we have seen uh, pitting issues that are undetected from uh, ultrasonic thickness testing. Uh, some of the newer shear wave and, uh, and uh, bottom scans do a little better job but you really don't know what you've got going on. If you have a, a platform that's gone through a sale and you don't necessarily get all the documentation of the maintenance history or even what how the, uh, the vessel is maintained inside, if you don't know whether it's coated or whether there's anodes in there and when the last time they were serviced, you may have a problem that is, is, is 
starting to become more active, uh, different types of corrosion. And you may need to get in there and identify what you have and, and how much time you have to deal with before you have a big capital investment in that pressure vessel in either major repairs or complete vessel replacement. Uh, many times the coating type of um, systems may help extend the life of a vessel, but that's only if it's uh, properly maintained. Once the coating starts breaking down, we see accelerated corrosion in, in pitting and, and other type of defect type corrosion activity, and it can actually um, ha have the vessel fail more rapidly than if the vessel were not coated and you got a uh, more generalized uh, corrosion system going on. Um, many times everyone uh, leaves the electricians uh, to their own devices. Uh, they follow a, a very comprehensive set of regulations with the uh, National Electric Code. However, it's good to bring the electrical uh, system and the electrical maintenance into your CMMS so that you can help get things scheduled together and it, it affords an opportunity to give reminders of when the major um, maintenance such as cleaning uh, your buckets and, and parts inside your main uh, breakers and, and large electrical panels, you need to get that scheduled at the same time you're you're doing your other maintenance work. So having it included in the CMMS uh, it, it can be a real nice feature. Uh, another thing where we sometimes uh, see on platforms that uh, some maintenance problems are, are occurring that is not noticed because people are, are so involved with the process is just looking at your seal structure. Now, API RP2 uh, deals with the structure of the platform and jacket, and it has uh, periods for required inspections. But sometimes the de decks and ladders, things that can cause a safety hazard within a few months, uh, may fall between those uh, frequencies. So as people are walking around doing safety inspections, they should be looking at decks and ladders, looking for problems where you can generate either a uh, a personnel hazard, or you may lose your secondary containment with your sills, your sill plates. Um, now, looking at uh, at your maintenance programs, if you have a maintenance backlog where you never seem to get to some of the repair items, they've they've gone on for five, six, or even 12, 18 months where something's not being completed, that tends to indicate you have a problem with with getting the needed maintenance done. Um, you may need to add additional maintenance. You may need to uh, look at how you're doing your maintenance to improve that. Uh, regulators, when they see a long maintenance backlog, may have some concern with how well your system is working. It, it may also indicate that you're doing um, you're fixing as things break, and then you become inundated with just the brush fires that come up day to day, and you don't, are not meeting your preventative maintenance goals. Uh, safety walk downs are a good way to identify these hazards and can identify other fitness for service type problems. So, today may seem very, it's overwhelming to me. I, don't think I'd want to be a, a company trying to comply with, with SEMS and, and looking at this if you don't already have much of this built. But all is not lost. The CMMS can actually help you implement a mechanical integrity program. It's kind of like a glue that binds everything together. If you take your existing programs where you have uh, preventative maintenance schedules, if you know you're looking at your safety valves on a certain basis, if you take the frequencies or, or the schedule for your tank and vessel internals and put them into your CMMS, you'll start to have one-stop shopping. You will be able to start um, developing uh, a better plan for your major shutdowns, and you'll be able to monitor all of your maintenance activity and see that you're making progress on your, on your preventative schedule as well as uh, 
uh, taking care of your repairs and making sure your backlog uh, remains under control. Um, the CMMS will help you so that you don't miss your testing frequency and the, so that you, either your regulators won't give you a problem or you won't have an unexpected failure of a safety system because it's not being checked frequently enough. Um, the CMMS should give you a true prediction of all your maintenance and repairs that must occur at a major shutdown. If you're going to, if you do maintenance shutdowns once a year, you can't afford to miss a particular year. You can't afford to miss a, uh, a major uh, preventative maintenance element that needs to happen a certain year. You can't afford to miss that on that shutdown. Uh, the equipment and systems that have re routine preventative maintenance scheduled by CMS should also have the procedures developed uh, and may be the basis for your critical spare parts list. I know that Steve and, and I think Carlos were talking about this. When you have something that, that is in the CMMS, it's on a, a scheduled basis, those are the are, tend to be the more important elements in your me mechanical integrity program those are the ones where you need to develop procedures. So what you have in the CMMS would tend to be a higher priority. Try and develop or bring in the procedures for those. Now, everything does not have to exist within the CMMS program. It's a, uh, a build as you go, or you can, you can select how much information you're going to put in that system and how much you're going to keep with your uh, your specialist or your expert in that area. Many times we'll see a bunch of separate spreadsheets for each platform with all the tanks or vessels, the different uh, inspection intervals, and even the results or where the records are kept from the different type of inspections. You may not need to put that all in the computerized system as long as you know where to find it and it can be coordinated or it's glued together by the CMMS as a scheduler and, and as a, a, a system to identify who the holder of the documents are. Finally, maintenance responsibilities, the detailed information like I was talking about with the tanks and vessels, records and other management tools can be retained by a specialist in that field. So the CMMS does not have to be the behemoth that some people think it is. It's a tool to coordinate. You can build it out uh, as much as you as you think is appropriate, and that depends on the size of your facility and um, the the different people that you have working. You may have a a uh, facility engineer, or you may have certain specialists in certain areas, and they will take care of certain uh, um, of these records that uh, will help determine what you need to put in CMMS and how you manage the system. So. Um, those are some of the insights that we've seen looking at uh, SEMS or SEMP type elements out on platforms with our operators here in California, some of the uh, tips or things that we've learned or seen uh, with them over the last 10 years. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Steve. Okay, very good. Am I coming through all right? All right, excellent, excellent. Um, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to do is take a few minutes and um, put a little perspective on CMMS, uh, assist, uh, Computerized Maintenance Management System, CMMS, and uh, remind everybody that SEMS, like a lot of the safety management systems, are performance-based. Uh, and also things are constantly changing and evolving. Uh, a few years ago, it was actually acceptable just to have your, the memory of your maintenance manager or uh, scrap notes written down as part of the formulation of your maintenance program. Uh, obviously, the fact that safety management systems regulations like SEMS, PSM, and RMP encompass the mechanical integrity uh, element mean that you've got to be a little more diligent in making sure things are done properly and documented. But a key thing to remember is that these programs are, it, it's a performance-based, these are performance-based standards and there are a variety of ways to get the job done. Um, some informal, formal, and as Mark mentioned, some things you might want to task out to specialists, uh, things that are highly computerized, things that are not so computerized, and also the, um, 
the framework for uh, the computerized maintenance management systems is also constantly evolving as uh, computer hardware platforms and also software constantly changes. So again, I just wanted to make sure that these are performance-based standards and these will all morph to the organizational structure and the specific equipment that you've got at your facility. So again, there's a wide spectrum of these, but I want to talk about our key functions that are necessary as part of CMMS. Uh, manufacturer recommended testing frequencies, inspection frequencies, preventive maintenance frequencies, these all need to be part of your CMMS. Logging testing and inspections, logging PM, putting down your observations, what you've seen, uh, has the equipment been functioning, was it, was it failed state, was there something else degraded on it, all these things should be incorporated into your mechanical integrity program, and as Mark mentioned, the ACMMS is an easy way for monitoring this and keeping it up to date. And also encapsulating procedures for performing the required action and other key data. Uh, safety precautions necessary for maintenance, parts needed, parts used, helping maintain spare parts in, um, inventory, scheduling activities, providing reminders. These are all things where a CMMS can shine and provide a lot of benefits. That's why in many cases facilities have uh, evolved into a CMMS type program. Uh, work order generations, uh, modifying uh, uh, and trending uh, in, uh, information from testing and inspections, planning ahead, and as Mark mentioned, if there's ancillary equipment that needs to be maintained at the same time, a CMMS is a good uh, platform, no pun intended, for getting the embodiment of this information and making sure it gets done. And I did mention spare parts management. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is uh, move forward uh, towards a little example of a computerized maintenance uh, management system. There's a lot of programs out there. Um, a lot of the uh, larger companies and larger facilities uh, are using some of the more complex programs. Uh, Main Saver is one that a lot of people are familiar with and, uh, and have applied very successfully at a lot of facilities. Software is constantly changing. What I'd like to do is uh, turn this back over uh, to Carlos and Spencer for uh, going through a uh, sh uh, short demonstration, an example of the application of CMMS. And in this case, they'll use one of the programs that are out there called SIMS Solution. And so let me turn this back over to Carlos. And, and also what I'd like to do is I botched his introduction earlier. Carlos is, has a bachelor's and master's from uh, mechanical engineering from the Rochester Institute, Institute of Technology. Carlos, come on up. All right. Hey, Spencer, are you there? I'm here. Perfect. Okay. I think you want to move, bring your email now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about so that. You're, uh, you're, on, you're online now, Spencer. This is all you. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, it's my fault. I, let me go back to my apologies. Okay. No problem. So Spencer's going to go ahead and get ready here, and he's just going to show you one example of a, uh, of a computerized maintenance management software as Steve uh, said. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take you through uh, just an example of how this can be set up. And there are many, many CMMS programs out there. Uh, this is just an example of how uh, one can be set up. Uh, I'm going to show a few examples of setting up a PM uh, where information can be stored how documents could be tied together, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so as we, this introductory page uh, has the different elements of SIMS uh, identified, and the purpose of that is just to indicate that, okay, policies can be integrated with uh, into the CMMS program. For example, if you were to go to the safety and environmental information section here, uh, the policy information can be you know, uploaded into the program directly. You can also have the uh, the documentation for 
the safety information located in an appendix in a manual format or volume format. Uh, one example of that is if I were to uh, click on this link and bring up uh, the information for process flow diagrams, for instance. Uh, now I'll we'll zoom in on that. It is in the probably should be rotated to see that, but just to give you an idea, okay, you have your process flow diagrams with all of the equipment identified uh, in a schematic format or PNID format. Uh, taking from that, inf taking the information from this document and translating that into a uh, into data within the CMMS program that can be utilized. Uh, if you were to come over here to the uh, Equipment Information Manager, then you'll notice that the information has been entered into the system into an asset management system. And that equipment can then be utilized uh, throughout your program in various ways. We'll show you a couple examples of that. Uh, now, just going, coming, I'll come back to this in just a moment. Uh, one thing I'd like to show you that is within this uh, policy structure, uh, one of the sections is also mechanical integrity. If you go into this mechanical integrity section, you can look at uh, the policy and how you're addressing the regulations. But then you also have appendices to indicate, OK, we have procedures. We have other evidence of implementation of this program. Yeah, hey, hey Spencer. Yeah, go ahead. Can you go ahead and open up that uh, the policy there, mechanical integrity? No, uh, up a little bit. Oh, no. this yes. Is, this is good too. Okay. So this is just just to show you in here. You have access to this is your policy of of actually how you perform mechanical integrity. Um, in this policy here, it needs to describe um, how work orders are created who's responsible for creating them, who is handed off to, and then who verifies that the work was all was done. All this needs to be included in this in this policy and describe the, the entire procedure of, of work order generation uh, all the way through to I mean, to verification. So just, I just wanted to input that and, and let you know that that's that's part of the policy what needs to be in that in in here. The uh so if you have actual procedures uh, loaded up, either equipment specific or more global to the system, then you can load those up throughout the system and link them into uh, these appendices. And this is just one example of a, uh, a manufacturer supplied you know, document that uh, can be loaded up within the, within the CMMS program that, for easy reference uh, to look at those manufacturer's recommendations. Okay. Uh, coming back to the and, and it's also oh, yeah, just uh, just you know attaching the documents so you have it all here you know makes it easy for the operators to to access that stuff so when they when they have the the work order given to them they can then have easy access to the actual manuals to to do that maintenance. The method of linking all of those documents together and so forth, we're not going to go through a lot of detail there, but just uh, we'll show you a, a, a little bit of that. Uh, you can, for instance, for a uh, an equipment category or individual equipment item or asset, you have the ability of uh, drilling down on that item and loading up uh, a lot of information uh, for that piece of equipment. For instance, you can give descriptions and summaries and where that uh, documentation is located. You can upload a photo of it. Uh, you can do many things that will be uh, very uh, easily accessed by that operator doing that uh, operations activity or maintenance. Uh, you can also locate uh, other auxiliary documents. For instance, you have uh, any maintenance records and inspections that are resident with that piece of equipment. Uh, you can upload other related documents, equipment specific other procedures and specifications and so forth. Uh, now, if I were to go to, for instance, this uh, maintenance records and inspections link here and then indicate that I'd like to uh, perform an inspection, you would have the ability to either utilize embedded inspection templates that have been developed within the system, or you can 
upload an ex external file, be it in Microsoft Word or any other format, the point being is that you'd be able to develop a history of maintenance uh, records for that piece of equipment. Uh, other records that would be accumulated here would be uh, work orders and any corrective maintenance that may have been uh, put together and prevent records. Yeah, uh, and that's important yeah. because if, a, if an auditor comes on site and says, hey, I want to see your maintenance records for this piece of equipment, you can then go ahead and pull it up and show that whole history for that piece of equipment and say, hey, you know, you can verify that, that all that maintenance was, was indeed completed. Yeah. Now, that, what I just showed was an example of uh, on a uh, manual or ad hoc basis, you'd have the ability to, you know, add a record uh, to the system. Now, there's also a very important element of, of CMMS systems that uh, is referred to as preventative maintenance or PM. Uh, the basic premise behind which is uh, behind that concept is being reminded on some schedule or some trigger, be it uh, use of equipment or uh, so hours of operation or a calendar-based reminding system. Uh, so the uh, the importance of being reminded is is very important with CMMS being one of its primary features, given that you have to uh, obviously. As Steve mentioned earlier, you can rely on the memory. Uh, previously, you could rely on the memory of the maintenance operator or uh, mechanic, but there's so much going on with CMMS, it is very helpful to have a database to utilize the reminding features and so forth. Uh, I jumped over to a work order section uh, uh, or a PM task section that allows us to see a collection of all of our preventative maintenance items that are scheduled on some frequency. And if you were to click on any one of these items, it'll give you some detail as to what is going on there. Now, these are just samples. Uh, but if I were to, uh, you, could you could characterize and change the details of uh, what's going on here by coming into this, uh, this area. You can indicate who is assigned, whether it's a an individual group or entire facility that would be assigned this particular task. And this this system has a reminding system, as many other CMMS programs do, to uh, either send an email or have some internal reminding system and collection of tasks that need to be accomplished. And when you go through the, uh, the different steps of this creation process or editing process for this PM, You'll notice that you have different recurrence patterns that can be established with end dates and, you know, similar to other recurrence engines out there that you may have seen. As you go through the process of uh, either associating with an internal equipment database, uh, other details that may be established uh, from an organizational standpoint for these items, you have those capabilities. As you go through the different uh, steps of this, you can had safety notes and different instructions. The the setup of these items, you know, the benefit of that is is realized when the operator has that document in front of them, with all with all of those details and resources to have all that information at their fingertips. So in typical of P, uh, PM systems or CMMS systems, you have uh, these PM tasks that represent. Uh, a repository of data that then gets created on some frequency and that those tasks that are created on that frequency are referred to as work orders. So if we were to jump over to the work order system, you'll see that, okay, we have a specific task that's been assigned. And if I were to uh, click on the little printer icon on the far right, you'll see a printed, a printable version of this document. And so in this uh, particular system, uh, you would receive, as an operator, a reminder, either in an email or some other uh, reminder means that, okay, there's a task that needs to be completed for this equipment item, and here are your instructions to perform these tasks with these steps. And then there is a closeout process that uh, typically is, is implemented. <clears throat> that closeout process uh, for a work order is, is very important uh, so that you can demonstrate that those items have been uh, closed out in the proper manner. 
Uh, one example of that, <clears throat> in this uh, particular instance, with the sufficient privileges and uh, abilities within the system, you can indicate that this item is complete uh, by putting in comments and changing the status uh, and going, uh, going through a few steps to make sure that an item is closed out pro uh, properly. Uh, the other, there are other ways of uh, modifying the system or using other portions of the system to uh, make that closeout process a little bit more elaborate, but a little bit more uh, subject to op uh, authorization from other personnel and management within the company. Now, one other thing I'd, I'd like to highlight within the uh, work order creation process. If you were to do corrective maintenance, if you were to discover an issue at the facility that you needed, to, you wanted to document, you could indicate this is a single work order. If you indicate that it's recurring, that's uh, a synonym to uh, preventative maintenance, and so you'd be creating a, uh, a, a PM by indicating that there is some recurrence to that item. You would put in a title. Uh, you would indicate who should be assign this particular item. You would go through the process of uh, establishing a recurrence pattern and what the triggers should be. You would choose an equipment item that would be related to this uh, particular work order so that as that work order gets closed out, you have some uh, means of recording. Uh, you could look up by equipment, for example, items that have been closed out. Add your safety notes and instructions. Add concrete procedural steps embedded right within the work order. You can add parts and uh, to the work order from the database of the parts inventory system. Can you can you oh, go yeah. uh, go back real quick, Spencer? Sure. And so in the in the steps, I just wanted to point out that. It's um, that this is the point <clears throat> when you can go ahead and, and add those those documents and those maintenance procedures, so that you know when you actually hand this over to your maintenance personnel, they have all the information at, at hand to them. And I just wanted to point out that that's that's something that's um, you know fairly important for for the maintenance procedures to be attached to that. Yeah, previously developed documents or uploaded documents can be loaded into, as you said, the work order system. So that when that work order is printed out, you have all that supplementary information uh, right there with the work order. Uh, so as you add other details of the work order, then those items, uh, when that work order is closed out, uh, the parts inventory is updated. And on this screen, uh, labor details are recorded in terms of how long uh, certain tasks took to, to complete. And that can integrate with your employee database. And so there are various features available. You can also, within these types of systems, create other references and links that are custom uh, to that document uh, or to that work order. And that's a configurable item, typically. Uh, so as you, uh, as you click Finish uh, to this, you, you have the ability to see your handiwork uh, within the work order system uh, where you have the title entered, who it was assigned to, and other details. And you have these uh, sorting drop-down menus uh, to filter uh, very easily what's, what you see on the page. And these are configurable within uh, many systems where you can add other filtering mechanisms and so forth uh, so that you can more easily get at your information. For instance, if you want to look at all completed items, uh, this would modify your view so you can see uh, any completed records because it is, and uh, you know, Carlos will have ha has already talked about this. Probably has some other comments here that uh, showing evidence that you have completed work orders, as referenced earlier, also in other parts of the demonstration, is very important. So that you can indicate and you show evidence of implementation of your mechanical integrity program. Uh, there are, you know, other uh, parts of the system that. Uh, we could go into some detail about, you know, for instance, the equipment information manager. We'll just show a. We, sh we looked at this a moment ago, but there are uh, certain abilities and features that you would have to integrate into the system. Uh, for instance, you could uh, 
if you were to now there is I should I should note that uh, this next part of the program is uh, has been developed uh, utilized and utilized in the maritime industry and we're bringing uh, many of those features uh, into the program from that industry so you know, keep that in mind as you see a few of these items but if you come into uh, the component editor, for instance, and you look at okay, we have uh, our, our different platforms within our different divisions of the company. Depending on your access to the system, you would have uh, the ability to look at uh, various aspects of that information. So you could expand and look at the components and machinery, the different uh, uh, elements of that program would be easily viewable uh, according to what you have uh, you have entered into the system. You could establish maintenance tasks, so for instance, that are specific to uh, that particular uh, platform. And uh, from a management view, you could uh, get a handle on, okay, what's happening at the various platforms throughout uh, that division or company uh, to very easily see from an enterprise, enterprise view, okay, what's happening uh, with everything, not just one specific uh, platform. So you have uh, at the platform itself, you would have, you know, access to uh, an installed application, for instance, or you could do inspections, uh, do drills, do various uh, tasks and work orders within an installed application. Uh, but then there's a web-based portal for administrative purposes as well, and there's an interaction between Shore and platform within this program. And the reason that it would be an installed application, for example, is if you have uh, difficulty you know, maintaining a, a consistent internet connection. Uh, you'd have various, uh, various tasks available to you to complete. Uh, if you, uh, now, Carlos, you may, if you'd like me to go into more detail with respect to this, I can, but I just wanted yeah, to give I an think overview. That's, um, I think that's pretty good, Spencer. We just wanted to highlight that one of the vulnerabilities we've seen is, um, <clears throat> is communication and, and communication between platforms and also communication from the platforms back to the mainlander or home base, if you will, um, just so that you know everyone's kind of involved in, in what's going on there, that if, if things are happening on the platform, maintenance tasks, work orders, parts being ordered, things like that, they have a good means of communicating that back to, to the home base or to other platforms. Um, you know, potentially platforms have a similar setup and, and they can learn from each other, for example, is, is one uh, potential benefit of that. But it's just a, it's just a vulnerability we've seen and, and we wanted to try, to try to address that and try to get that, that moving in the right direction. It's, it's communication between platforms and and back to the mainland as well. And this is uh, just one way of, of kind of addressing that. So I think that's, I think that's pretty good on that part, Spencer. Okay. Uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the other aspects of the program, uh, there are, just to give you uh, an idea of, of the different elements of the system, you have the, let's see here, uh, one, one item that I, I'd like to uh, highlight is that you have uh, typically within CMMS systems, you have the ability to either establish templates for inspections or the ability to upload documents externally. Uh, so making sure that your inspection forms and so forth are showing uh, the proper information to do a, a proper inspection of that system is important. Uh, so you can develop inspections within the CMMS program. You can look at, as we mentioned before, the asset system that uh, indicates that uh, that shows a, a, a library, basically, or, or asset library of all of your equipment uh, so that you're not missing anything. And then you have the PM tasks and work orders that are fundamental to CMMS systems to uh, establish those frequencies and so forth uh, that tasks need to be completed. Uh, also within CMMS systems, you'll uh, also have document management systems and, and other elements but I, I wanted to uh, focus ma mainly on the maintenance uh, management portion of this. And, and that, that's basically what I uh, wanted to cover. If there are other things you would like to see, just you know, let me know and I'll take you through some other things. Yeah, perfect. I think that was, uh, I think that was exactly uh, what we were looking for, Spencer, just to, just to try to show uh, one way of uh, meeting those regulatory requirements as far as 
um, documentation, you know, formulating your, your actual program, your mechanical integrity program, and then, you know, keeping those records and, and having easy access to all the, you know, everything from maintenance procedures to your maintenance records. It's, it's just, we just wanted to show all those requirements and one way of meeting those. So I, I think I was going to go hand it back over to Steve, and uh, we're going to wrap this up pretty quick here. Okay, mic working? Okay, good. Uh, I'll go ahead and you'll be seeing the slide in just a moment. I'd like to go ahead and reach our conclusion. By the way, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Spencer, for a nice demo of a, an example CMMS program. I hope everybody um, got a little bit of a flavor for what those things can do. But again, a reminder that the safety management system regs are performance-based. How you approach your program, what software you use, how you go about doing your job, lots of options, and you have to make sure it fits in well with how you work at the facility. Anyhow, to conclude, mechanical integrity is a very important issue. I think we've covered the regulatory requirements, the potential impacts of not having good mechanical integrity program. And bottom line is, as well as safety importance, the balance to application, it's, it can be good for business if it's managed effectively and properly implemented. So with that, what I'd like to do is quickly close out. And before we get to the question and answer period, uh, just let, and before we make uh, Mark, myself, and Carlos available for questions, I'd just like to mention a reminder, this is a continuing uh, webinar series uh, on the Offshore Facility SEMS program. Uh, the next one is January 12th. It'll be on update, uh, bringing a little bit more up to speed with respect to the, the latest SEMS requirements. And also, the focus will be hazards analysis, and the, specifically the HAZOP study approach, uh, layer protection analysis, and SIL integration, how all that fits together. The intention is not to turn everybody into HAZOP facilitators. We will, it'll be another 90-minute module like today, but the intention is to give you a little flavor for those hazards analysis techniques that are out there, and how that fits in an overall framework with a lot of the advanced control and protection systems that are out there. That'll be the main objectives, and I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. For those of you who are interested in uh, HAZOP facilitation or details of the HAZOP method, we have a separate webinar series. Uh, module 5 of our, our HAZOP series is actually this Thursday. You can check our website or, or check our newsletters for more information on that. Um, just a reminder, uh, background, we have been doing these webinars for a while. So uh, Several of these are available online to view if you weren't a participant at that time. July 22nd, September 14th, and October 14th are of particular interest. Uh, coming up, as I mentioned, January 12th. Uh, February 10th, we're going to be doing operating procedures. March 3rd, uh, safety and environmental information. March 29th, uh, management of change and pre-startup reviews. April 19th, uh, training contractor safety management and safe work practices. Emergency action plans will be May 12th. June 7th will be incident investigation, and July 14th, uh, audit requirements on how to make sure your, your, your program is actually being implemented properly. Again, this is a continuing program. All these are being recorded and will be available for uh, viewing online uh, a reasonable time after the webinar. So let me go ahead and open it up for questions. I'll go ahead and invite Carlos and Mark up here. Uh, questions can come in either verbally Sure. I just wanted to ask Esther Do you want to come over here, Esther? Um, I just wanted to make a real quick comment. Um, we keep. This is Esther Brawley, and I just wanted to make a real quick comment. Um, we keep driving home the point of CMMS and CMMS, and I just wanted to make an observation that. Um, if you are getting a CMMS program off the ground from basically from scratch, um, if you try to overdo it, I, I've just seen so many facilities that the thing just sits there and, and nothing's done with it. It just completely falls apart. And the reason why is because from what my observation is, is they just try to do too much. Um, there's no regulation that says every field and every checkbox in the program needs to be completely filled out. You have to type from scratch all the procedures and steps and this or that. 
Um, I, I'm all about shortcuts and not shortcuts in maintenance or PM, but shortcuts in using, utilizing software and that. Take advantage of scanning technology today. I think everybody's got a Xerox scanner in their organization. Scan your manuals. Upload them. Scan, you know, you have procedures and documents already laid out in Word. Either upload them work order, or just say in the instructions part, go grab the manual that's in so-and-so's office, or check pages 5 to 10, or go grab procedure XYZ that's located on our file server. Um, just try to utilize shortcuts to just get the information there so you're using the CMS for tracking, um, having a repository for all your equipment, um, and having a repository for tracking your maintenance and showing that it's getting completed and facilitating the delegation process. Don't overwhelm yourself because then the whole thing is going to fall apart. Now, Esther, thank you for your comment. Actually, that's um, that evolutionary process is true for a lot of the different elements of SIMS, and certainly it's especially true for mechanical integrity. And I think. Mark, one of Mark's observations too, where that's certainly true for a lot of the SIM programs that he's been auditing over the years. Anyhow, um, Carlos and Mark, when I invite you up here, we'll uh, field some more uh, questions. And uh, questions can come in either verbally or if you'd like to post something on the chat window, uh, we'll be glad to address that. Actually, why don't we let, why don't you give the mic to, or, or why don't you wear the mic, but let her just talk into it real quickly. <laughs> so if on your platforms you utilize all contractors, how do you suggest going about the mechanical integrity program? Okay, um, basically you're responsible for what the contractors are doing. You either need to uh, monitor them and their specific actions or you need to provide them with the guidelines and framework for doing it. So they're essentially acting as, as uh, your personnel. One of the things I really would caution, and a lot of things that I think people have encountered problems with contractors before, is not securing uh, maintenance, inspection, and testing records. Especially if they're out there doing things, when they are saying goodbye and leaving your facility, they should be providing you with records for what they've done so you can archive it and have it at your facility so you can prove those kind of things were done. And I see Mark over here nodding his head, so I'll, I'll let him augment that a little bit. Yeah, things where you have contractors come in and, and perform certain uh, maintenance and servicing, those records you should get access to, you should probably retain. Uh, if you can get it put in your CMMS system, that's a great place to have it. Uh, potentially they could upload it for you, uh, but you need to have it. We've, we've seen things where we've been told, oh, the records for the crane or the, the records on the corrosion monitoring program are with the contractor. Well, where are they? Can we get them? We need to see them. You have an audit. Uh, it's, in, it's at least inconvenient, and should anything happen, you may not be able to get the records that could potentially point the finger at a fault with your contractor rather than with yourself. So you want to control your own destiny on that. Very good. Sure. Yeah, you'll need a mic. I just wanted to say um, when you util utilize a lot of contractors, what I like to do at facilities is you treat the contractor as an extension of your employee. So you still have the equipment. You have the equipment in your CMMS program or your whatever you're using to track your PM. You have the PMs uploaded. You're tracking, and instead of delegating that work order that's come due to your employee, you just delegate it to your contractor. They are now responsible for coming back to you with the closed work order, whatever findings or comments they found, and whatever other documentation or inspection documentation that they use. And then you can then file that for that specific work order. Um, if they have completely their own entire separate documentation, then you just say closed in your work order and you say, okay, contractor uh, Bob's records are located in this filing cabinet in so-and-so's office. Um, so that if you're audited, you know exactly the work order in your CMMS tells you exactly where to go to find it. But you're still in control of tracking the PM 
delegating them to your contractor and making sure that they're closing them properly. Um, so that's basically how you need to really co um, monitor your contractors. And usually that starts with listing out the PMs that you think you need to do and at the frequencies you think they're supposed to be done at based on the manufacturer or industry best practices. You sit down with your contractor, look at the PM schedule, and agree to it. Um, but, and then definitely watch out for the invoice that they give you that's scribbled and you have no idea what they did. It just says they showed up and then left. So you just got to watch out for that. And another question. So what information should be included in your maintenance procedures? Okay, very good question. Um, um, for a performance-based standard, the only right answer is you need to include in your maintenance procedures the kind of information to keep the maintenance personnel, person safe, properly safe in the equipment so that they can do their job safely, and also the kind of information necessary so they can do their job completely. When they're finished with their maintenance activity, the equipment is restored to 100% operation and um, will fulfill its design function consistent with our original definition of mechanical integrity, which is making sure the equipment operates as designed. Now, that general fluffy answer is, is, your, is your bottom line guideline. For each piece of equipment, it is going to vary. Some pieces of equipment where, where um, you don't need a lot of details, that's fine. For other pieces of equipment, when there's problems re reassembling it, or, or possible uh, hazards when the, when the individuals involved in maintaining the equipment, you may need a lot more detail. You may need to specify specific personnel protective equipment for them and detailed step-by-step -step with cautionary statements in the, in the maintenance procedure. So kind of a general answer, and the bottom line is as a performance-based standard, it will vary from equipment to equipment. And I will kind of echo what, what, echo, uh, what Esther Mark and Carlos said, which is basically, don't find this so overwhelming that you don't get started. Go ahead and, and begin to chip away at a program, even if you've got an asset that your company just acquired where all the records had disappeared, and all of a sudden you're in charge of a monster program with a lot of responsibilities. Uh, how do you eat the elephant? One bite at a time. You just got to get started and start with the basic framework and then build on it. Recognize it is evergreen, recognize it is evolving, and make sure it's kept up at, throughout the plant life. Uh, Carlos, Mark, other comments? All right, thank you. All right, very good. Well, in that case, I'll thank everybody for their participation, their thoughtful questions, and we'll look forward to...